and the Parkinson Voice Project for allowing me to be here today, to be present with each of you as you journey through your life. Almost 35 years ago it was, in fact it was 35 years and a couple of months, my life seemed like it was going just the way it was supposed to. I was a wife, a mother of three, and we had our ups and downs. You know how a couple has to kind of go through their growing pains? But Vince and I, we were so in love. And I'll never forget the day that my mother called me. Vince had been having some symptoms, and we thought he was having dental issues. And so he went to the doctors, and what we thought was going to be, you need new crowns, he called my mother because he didn't want me to be alone. And my mom called me and said, Sheila, I have something I have to share with you. She goes, is anyone with you? And Vince's mother was with me at the time. They knew that he was going to the doctors. And I wanted to go with him, but he didn't want me to go with him. He goes, oh, it's just a dentist, I'll be fine. What he shared with me was, is that the doctor said, I have a 99% chance that I have cancer. And he said, and I'm going to need surgery. This was a Friday. I'm going to need surgery on Monday morning. I felt like somebody opened up the earth, and there was a giant hole, and I was falling in. I couldn't get to him fast enough. My mother-in-law was so gracious to be able to take our children and I was able to spend the time that I needed with my husband just to embrace the change that had taken place in our life, our loss. Because at that moment, it was a loss of hopes and dreams of what we thought life was gonna be. It was different. We grieved, we cried, we held each other. He didn't want anyone to know. He didn't want to see his brothers. He didn't want to see friends. He didn't want his work to know. Well, that's part of the journey when someone is ill. For others to find out that you have an illness, then it makes it real for you. I wanted everyone to know because I wanted him to be supported. But I had to respect him. So Monday morning comes his surgery. And I remember the morning of his surgery um, my sister came in the room and said that her husband had left her. Before he went into surgery, he called to tell my brother-in-law how precious life was and that every day is worth giving your love to someone and that we have blessed moments with many ups and downs. I think if we hadn't endured some of those ups and downs in life, and it was really growing pains, him climbing the ladder for success, me being a stay-at-home mom. Um, I loved what I did. All my life, I wanted to be a mother. We even prayed before um, I had my children is when was my career supposed to come? And we got that my career was to come after our children were raised. We got married, and the month later, I was expecting my first child. I remember Vince, he was raised on a dairy farm, saying, so how long are you going to be pregnant? He said, now, is it like a cow? I go, well, <laughs> how long's a cow pregnant? Nine months. Yes, I'm like a cow. So I felt like a cow before I gave birth. But anyway, you know, it was our journey, though. And I think that that was the key for us, that this was our journey. This was our cancer. I had no idea what we were about to embrace. But I knew that I needed to create a new balance, and I knew I needed to find hope, strength, and healing. So today, while I don't know your journeys, I'm going to share with you my journey and what helped me. And in, 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 in this day, I hope that you will be able to take away a little piece about the sacredness of what you're doing. Because to be able to journey with someone during the toughest times of their life is a sacred calling. To be present to their present moment is important. Our stories, life, love, everyday life, illness, change. Life changes when someone we love is diagnosed with an illness with no cure. 
As we know, with illness, it brings grief. Well, I had no idea that I was going to have grief after my husband was diagnosed. But yet all these feelings that I was having was grief. The grief of, is he going to grow old with me? Is he going to be able to raise our children? The part of making decisions. Are we be able to handle it financially? You know, what will I need to do so that we pay bills? Will we have insurance? Will he be able to go to football games and soccer games with my children? What if he's not here? Ooh, no, I can't think of that. Push it away. I wanted the miracle. And so together we prayed. Every night we would hold hands and we would pray. But that anticipatory grief, that was a loss that I was having an impending loss. And that didn't have to mean death. It just meant that life had changed. And with life changes comes many different forms of grief. There's the sadness, the isolation, the anger, the loss of hopes and dreams, and oh my goodness, I couldn't remember. The forgetfulness, and then the depression. It might not have been that I had the depression, but Vince was having a depression. A depression of not having control over his life, of not being able to give the way he had given. When you have a vibrant man, who could do everything, and then suddenly he couldn't because he became so weak and frail. So I think it's important for us to look at the whole person. And I think today's talk, you know, when when you go home, I think that it's very important for you to share with your loved ones and with others that we're many parts, we're all one body, right? In a family. There's many pieces to a family. In friendship, there's many different dimensions. So I think it's important to look at what makes up a whole person. And I think it's important to look at what makes you the person you are and what makes your loved one the person they are. And then when we look at how life changes, then we might be able to see why there's so many different aspects to grief and why it's important to know a little bit about grief. So there's the past, there's life experiences, there's the family, there's the roles, the behaviors, there's the culture, there's the relationships, there's the do things. What did they do? What did they used to do? I mean, Vince cut the grass. He was left-handed, so he wasn't really good at a lot of different things. You know, like if I wanted him to clean the table or wipe the table, for some reason, he just didn't know how to squeeze that rag out right, you know? So I did good at that. But there was other things that he was so incredible. I was his cheerleader. He was my cheerleader. There's our body. There's the secret life, the political lights. And the secret life is, in a family... We all have our stories, our journeys, and when we live our lives, they're going to be different than the lives that we had with our parents or with our siblings. They become our lives. And there's little things that we interact with with our loved ones that, you know, he had nicknames for me or I had nicknames for him. He used to give me yellow roses and I hated it. I wanted red roses. Those were passion. That was love. But when he died... The yellow rose became the most important thing to me with his love. You know, so there's the perceived future. There's the transcendent dimensions. So there's a lot. So then we understand when all those things are involved, then there's suffering. The distress with events that threaten the intactness of a person. I know what happened to me. And I know it happened to Vince. Present and extent of suffering can only be known to the sufferer. So I say that because who is the sufferer here? Is the sufferer you, the care person? Or is the sufferer your loved one? Or is it both? I would say it's both. So all aspects of a personhood are susceptible to damage and loss. And damage, I don't mean, you know, like, oh, it's not a good thing and you need to get rid of it. 
But the injury to the heart, the injury to the soul, the injury to your being, that's the damage. But does that mean that you won't become stronger? Does that mean that you won't become more in love? Well, when Vince was diagnosed, we realized having the big house, having the best, that wasn't what was important. It was the beauty of the love that we shared. There were moments that we were close together, and then there was moments where it's like, I needed like a cow gone, take me away moment, because I needed to put me on my list and breathe. And he probably needed that with me too. A lot of times with suffering, in order to be able to create a balance, we often have to involve others to allow us to have some strength. People can sustain our personhood. But however, when you're a care partner, sometimes the people that are there in the very beginning might be gone tomorrow, the next day, or years to come. Yet here you are, still caring. Caring and having your suffering while your loved one is still caring and having theirs. But the f what's beautiful is, is that you are here that treasured gift that you give each other. So I think what we find is a new meaning for life. There's like a transcendence. I love this video. So what is empathy? And why is it very different than sympathy? Empathy fuels connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Empathy, it's very interesting. Teresa Wiseman is a nursing scholar who studied professions, very diverse professions where empathy is relevant and came up with four qualities of empathy. Perspective taking, the ability to take the perspective of another person or, or recognize their perspective as their truth. Staying out of judgment, not easy when you enjoy it as much as most of us do. <laughs> Recognizing emotion in other people and then communicating that. Empathy is feeling with people. And to me, I always think of empathy as this kind of sacred space when someone's kind of in a deep hole and they shout out from the bottom and they say, I'm stuck, it's dark, I'm overwhelmed. And then we look and we say, hey, you climb down. I know what it's like down here. And you're not alone. Sympathy is, ooh, <laughs> it's bad, uh-huh. Uh, no. You want a sandwich? <laughs> um, empathy is a choice, and it's a vulnerable choice, because in order to connect with you, I have to connect with something in myself that knows that feeling. Rarely, if ever, does an empathic response begin with at least. I had a, yeah. And we do it all the time, because you know what? Someone just shared something with us, it's incredibly painful, and we're trying to silver lining it. I don't think that's a verb, but I'm using it as one. We're trying to put the silver lining around it. So I had a miscarriage. Oh, at least you know you can get pregnant. I think my marriage is falling apart. At least you have a marriage. <laughs> John's getting kicked out of school. At least Sarah is an A student. But one of the things we do sometimes in the face of very difficult conversations is we try to make things better. If I share something with you that's very difficult, I'd rather you say, I don't even know what to say right now, I'm just so glad you told me. Because the truth is, rarely can a response make something better. What makes something better is connection. And I think that connection comes for us with our loved ones. That's the connection Vince and I were able to have. And I think it's very important for us, who are the care partners, to be able to offer that, to be present to someone's present moment, not only theirs, but yours as well. So I think in understanding grief, it's important to recognize that this is one of the tools that can help us to cope. So grief is a journey, and it takes time. No two people grieve the same. Would you say that in the diagnosis of your loved one, that 
you grieved the same way? How is it different? Anyone? Did you both grieve the same? How was theirs different than yours? It's always different because it's just like our thumbprint. And it's our roles. Feeling grief may come when you least expect it. You might be doing completely fine and all of a sudden you hear about something. Or you could be in the grocery store and suddenly you see a favorite cereal. Or you see a couple that can go and do things and just take off and be. Feelings are normal. And I think it's important for us to realize that they are normal. Grief comes with illness, life changes, and death. It's a psychological, spiritual, and social. So there's three realms that we have. So physically, mentally, and spiritually, we have gone through a change, which can bring grief. When we think about what's going on, when we worry about what's going on, when we look to the future, when we look backwards trying to think about the shoulda, coulda, wouldas, or what we would have done differently, or now I don't get to do this and now I don't get to do that. Our minds can be our greatest source of strength or they can be our greatest obstacles. I could think, oh my gosh, now I can't do this and this and this. Or I could think, how do I get the best medical care? Or I could think, okay, we might not be able to go on vacation right now, but what can we do as a family? What can we do to be able to be present to this present moment? We actually became best friends and that was what was beautiful but there was also times when best friends don't get along so when he would push my buttons he still got my little irish temper once in a while and he was italian so i need say no more <laughs> you know it's it's a process it's changing every day there's going to be good days there's going to be bad days there's going to be things where you're tired getting up and doing things, regular, normal routines. And then there's going to be days where they need you for a lot, and then their medical needs might need you, and then you're trying to do all the new roles that you're taking on. How many of you have had to take on new roles? And of those new roles, what is the most exhausting for you? Can some of you just share those with me? Yes. Working full time with three kids. It's another one. Taking care of the finances. I never knew that I had an accounting degree, you know, after, you know, when he was diagnosed. And making sure that everything was paid for, that we would be able to get the best of care. Yes. Making sure the medicine's taken at the right time, that is. It's so important. Because some of it's every four hours, some of it's every six hours, sometimes it's three times a day. There's not, a, the boxes don't work that way. Mm -hmm. It's another one. Physical. physical. Tell me about the physical. Mm -hmm. So being strong enough to push him in the wheelchair, catch him when he falls, I can relate. Putting the wheelchair in the car, it's a lot lighter some of them now, but putting them into the car, making sure that you had the oxygen tank, that's what I had to do. When he had to go to the bathroom, I had to put him on my back and I would carry him, giving him his feeding tube because he could not eat any longer. But we did it, and taking, taking a bath. He would get claustrophobic because he couldn't breathe. We had a big walk-in shower, but he couldn't be in that shower by himself. So I decided, okay, we're going to use the tub. And I put his boxer shorts on. I would wear the T-shirt. I'd get him into the bathtub. But I lit candles. I played music, sometimes bubble baths, you know. And I remember one time in a group similar to this where it was caregivers, care 
healthcare partners and the, you know him, um, they asked the question, do any of you feel like a burden? A lot of people raised their hands. Vince didn't raise his hand. And she goes, I noticed that you didn't raise your hand. And she said, may I ask why? And he goes, because we've made this our cancer. This is our journey. When I can't bathe myself, she makes it sexy. Boxer shorts. But you know, we had to have fun. Sometimes we need that comic relief to the grief that we have. And sometimes when we can't lift that wheelchair, we need help or we think, I think I can, I think I can, I know I can. I have to do this. And there'd be days that you'd do all the things that you needed to do, you get them in bed, you have to do your work because you've got to go back to work. And then you'd slip into bed and they would say, are you awake? And then we'd stay awake till four o'clock in the morning and now you'd be back up at six. But I would have never have changed those moments as exhausted as what I was. That was our time that we got to spend having a cup of tea. That was our time to talk about how we met. That was our time when he could share Do you think I'm going to make it? That was our time to talk about our faith, to talk about our children. That was our time. There was times I didn't know if I could give us our time because I was so exhausted. But when I would sit at the table with him, I knew I had it. I knew that I could. Precious memories, precious times, present to the present moment. It's a process And it's developing and involving many different changes. It's looking at things differently. It might not be the way you thought it would be when you said, I do, or the way you thought it would be if a parent was raising you and they could do everything with you. It's different. And a lot of times, things are natural, things are expected. But when someone is diagnosed, this isn't something natural then for us. It isn't something that we expected. But we have our minds. And our minds can be the greatest source of strength or the greatest obstacle. But they can also be tired sometimes. And there can be other times where it's vibrant. Reactions, there's many different kinds of reactions to loss. And again, I, I kind of combine the two, even when this says death, it doesn't necessarily have to be a death of a person. It's the death of the way things used to be. And so it's how can we make this be, that this is our new normal, our new life. I had to educate myself. If I didn't educate myself to first of all, know everything that I could about his cancer, then how could I help him? How many of you become experts in the field that your loved one is diagnosed in with Parkinson's? Have you done research? Mm -hmm. Have you um, then found out how to live a normal life when everything has changed? Do you want your lives to be normal? What's the new normal, right? It's creating the balance. So based on the unique individual perceptions of loss, grieving can be different. So we have to look at how did our families, when we were growing up, how did they function? Did you have a compassionate family? Or did you have one, this is what we need to do, matter of fact, A, B, C, D. When Vince and I got married, his family's Italian. You would think, oh, mama mia, come and give me a hug. Well, they were Sicilian. <laughs> so they were not the huggers. So guess what I introduced to them? The hug. So when you leave today, if you'd like a hug, I'd love a hug. Um, but it changed. And I was the person that helped people to open up, to share. You know, we talked about this. Like I said, he didn't want people to know. And I just said, he just needs time. And then over the years, it became better. It requires physical, emotional, and spiritual energy. When someone is diagnosed, can you imagine 
mentally, spiritually, emotionally, mentally, all the things that go in your mind. What were some of the things that went on in your minds when your loved one was diagnosed? And I ask this, and I know sometimes it's hard. That's not a sign of weakness when you can say, how am I going to pay the bills? How am I going to do this? Some of the things, will he be able to survive this? How sick will he get? Will I grow old with him? I thought I was the only one thinking these things. And then I thought I was a bad person, so I had guilt. How dare you think about something could happen to him when I wanted that miracle? So what are some of the things that mentally went through your mind? Good for you. So going on, keeping on moving. I think I can, I think I can, I know I can. That little engine that thought it could, that was us. I think I can. If a doctor said that they needed this, then I had to look it up the old-fashioned way. You know, nowadays, it's really nice because we have the internet and we have so much at our fingertips. You know, if you don't like one doctor, find one that you do like. You know, and it may be that what if we find out that we can't change anything? I kind of think with Vince's cancer, he was diagnosed at 29. It was a very rare cancer in his salvatory glands. There was only one in 40 cases in the entire world. And out of that one in 40 cases, all but one died the first year. His doctor decided not to tell us that he could just have a year. And Vince would say, so what do you think? Do you think, Doc, I'm, I'm going to make it? And he goes, Vince, I know you're going to make it. And he goes, well, how long do you think I have? And he goes, well, that's between you and God. He didn't want to tell Vince at the age of 29 that it's probably hopeless. And later on in life, that doctor on our journey, he said, I'm so glad I didn't say that. Because see, Vince needed that. He needed that, wow, well, nobody knows. And we really don't know. But I would say, you become that cheerleader. You become that advocate. And take time to enjoy the present moment. Even when you're exhausted and you can sit down and say, oh, thank you, God, for letting me have this moment that I can sit down. Or I need a shower because I'm tired or a bath, you know. I needed some of those things, that physically, that spiritual energy I needed. It's almost like running a jackhammer 12 hours a day. That's what goes through when we're care partners, when we're grieving, when we're trying to be the head of the household, when we're going back to work. All those things encompass our day along with everyday life. So the cultural response, the social, I mean, think about what people are saying. Do people stop and say, oh, what can I do and pour you? I mean, at first they acknowledge it, but this is our everyday life. This is what goes on every day. Most people are able to live a different type of a life. They have no idea. And you want to know something? I wouldn't want them to have any idea. I just wish that they would appreciate more the moments that they have. Um, there's the changes in routines. There's the changes in, when I say caregivers, care partners. Samantha shared with me today that the, the role that you've been given, what you call each other, is care partners. And I love that because that shows that you're united. That shows that you're together. That shares that you're whole. But there's the financial concerns. There's the needs. Do we need to move? Do we need to change our home so that it's, you know, adaptable to be able to help them? All those different things. Nobody would realize that stepping into a shower would be hard. No one would realize that going into a walk-in shower that they may have a hard time. No one would realize that when we're talking about life, that sometimes they might look at you and you think, do they have any idea what I'm going through? I had no idea what he was going through. But we tried to communicate that. But I didn't want him to know everything because I was this cheerleader. Little did he know, he was my cheerleader. So accepting the reality, it comes. That experience with pain and loss, it kind of adjusts to the way life used to be, to the way life is now. If we look in the rearview mirror all the time and say, oh, you know, here we were on this fast track, 
and we were supposed to be here today. We're going to do this tomorrow. Oh, and we're going to go on vacations. Nobody told me that I would have to worry that I'd have enough toilet paper for a day. You know, uh, we went down to the last piece of paper on a roll. We went down to where the soap would disappear. It was a game with my kids. Let's see how long we can use that soap. You know, they still do that to this day with their children. But we had to. We did what we needed to do to survive. But we didn't want to just survive. We wanted to live. And I think at first we go into survival mode when we have someone who is diagnosed. Survival mode, state of alert mode, you know, processor. We become a doctor. We become a nurse. We become the head of the household. But they are our cheerleaders. And sometimes they don't understand, and sometimes we don't understand. It's an adjustment for both. It's a reinvestment in emotional energy so that we can work together. But how do we take time for us? How do they take time for them? Because I don't know about you, I loved being with Vince, but there was sometimes I needed a break. And I'm sure there was times that he needed a break from me. So... I thought it would be important right here. It's very important to kind of know the dual process of Sustrobing and Schultz. And if we look at this as our mind, okay, we have everyday experience going on in our life. And then all of a sudden, we have that loss, the loss of the way things used to be. So then we have grief work. But then restoration, okay, we've been diagnosed. Now what do we need to do to live a normal life? So my restoration was, is I was a stay-at-home mom. I needed then to change the life changes. I ended up going back to work. Not only did I go back to work, but then I was still the mom. I was still the wife. Then I was the caregiver. Then I was the bill payer. I was the CEO of my household. I just didn't get paid the salary. There's the intrusive grief, you know, all those thoughts that keep coming. And if you see this zigzag here, that zigzag is because we will have the loss that we're dealing with, and then we'll have the everyday life changes. So we have the things that distract us from grief. You know, sometimes we need the music. Sometimes we need the ice cream cone. Sometimes we need the movie. Sometimes we need just to sit. Sometimes we need to go outside. But I think when we think about this, going back and forth, we have the denial. Oh, this couldn't be happening to us, but it is. You know, the avoidance of, boy, my husband didn't want anybody to know. He wanted to still do everything. But then when he couldn't breathe the way he used to breathe, he could no longer run three miles a day. I could keep running, but I had no idea what it was like that he couldn't run three miles a day like he was used to. I could keep jumping in the car and taking the kids and getting everything, but he couldn't drive anymore. So when my children would come home from school, he'd go, I need for you to vacuum, I need for you to do this, I want you to make your beds, mom needs this put on. I remember one day coming home, and my children were crying. And they go, Mom, every time that we come home, Dad never just says, Hi, how was your day? What did you do? Tell me about it, I missed you. It's just, it's almost like we have to do, do, do. So I remember Vince was doing something, and then he said, I want you to do this. And I said, you know what, Vince? And I, and I kind of regret this, but I don't regret it. Um, I said to him, you know, I said, if God's going to take you soon, because he was really being hard on the kids, I said, I'm going to pray for him to take you soon. And he goes, what did you just say? And I said, well... I said, the reason I said this is I don't want you to die. I don't want you to be out of our lives. I said, but my kids and your children, our children, when they come home from school, they can't wait to see you. They want to say, I love you, Dad. They want to tell you about their day. They want to drop their backpack and they want to play. And I said, and they need that. And with you, I said, it's almost like you're so regimented. You're almost like a Hitler. And he goes, am I really that bad? I said, worse. <laughs> and he goes, I just want to make it nice for when you come home. Because I can't vacuum for you. I can't make our bed. 
I can't put dinner on. I just want it to be nice for you. That conversation really deepened us even in our relationship because then I got to see why he was being the way he was because he had no control over some of the things, but there again, he was putting me first. And so then everything changed, but I think I had to name it and claim it. Do I wish I could have said it a little differently? Yes, but him being Italian, that's how he understood it. So on this next slide, and I don't know if you had this, but there's different pieces of paper that you could write this. This exercise that I do with people is, it's naming your grief. So on a piece of paper, um, on, on your table, or even on your thing, I want you to take a couple of moments right now, and I want you to list the grief that you're enduring right now, or that your family has endured, or that your loved one has endured, what you do to help yourself to heal and lift some of the symptoms. So like the grief could be, I've got to go back to work. So the symptoms are, I'm angry, I'm frustrated, I'm tired. So I want you to kind of list those things down now. So just take maybe two to three minutes, pop them down as quick as you can because again, these are normal feelings and it's okay to say them doesn't mean that you want to change, you do want things to change, but it's an important part of your healing process to recognize those, to name it and to claim it. So what are some of your grief moments? What are some of your symptoms? And what do you do to allow yourself to heal? What are some of the grief symptoms? Can somebody share some? Facial expressions sometimes, can that change? Where they used to be so excited to see you and then it can be where there's a little expression. We couldn't make love the way we used to. But then we realize that we could lay next to each other. We could hold each other's hands. We could express what we loved about each other. And let me tell you, that lasted a lot longer. That was a whole new way. But I think he needed to know that because at first it was like he felt he had these feelings, but he could not do those things, you know? So we found new ways. But, and, and I'm sure they go from being one age to then aging within a short manner of time. Vince may have died when he was in his 30s, but he looked like he was in his 80s. And it is hard when you see those, that change. What's another one? Communication. communication. Loss of communication. It's a very good one. What's another one? Frustration. Frustration about what? So the frustration of when you suggest things that might help them, that they don't want to listen. Part of it's their stubbornness too, you know, that they want to. However, though, if you took them to a doctor and they would say, you need to do A, B, C, and D, they would do it and we have to pay that bill where they could have had what we gave them, the advice, for free. Sounds like a lot of you can relate to that one. What's another grief? Loss of control. Control of what? Loss of activities, the future. That's vacations, going swimming, maybe riding a bike, running the vacuum. Yes. Very good one. And the, what's another one? How about freedom? And I think that goes across both ways. The freedom that you could just come and go when you needed to? Yes. The cognitive loss. I totally understand that my father-in-law had Parkinson's disease. And at first we just thought that he was just trying to have my mother-in-law do everything. You know, that they lived on a dairy farm. It's Gene, you gotta go finish milking those cows. Gene, you need to get the house cleaned up. And then he started talking softer. 
And then he couldn't walk the way he used to talk, or walk the way he used to walk. And he didn't talk the way he used to talk. And then it would take him a long time. So that cognitive, we were very much aware of. And then we found out that he had Parkinson's disease and had to have like a quadruple bypass as well. We just thought he wanted my mother-in-law to do it all. We didn't understand it. But he didn't know how to communicate it. So that cognitive loss is a big one. Any more? Change of role. Tell me about your change of role. Yes. Well, and the roles change. So being more of the motherly figure, where you want to have the passion and the holding the hands and that part, to having to be, I think being a care partner, it really does change the roles. But we have to find ways that we can still have that. And I think that that's important to share. But important to share, too, that there's many ways of expressing love and to be able to say, sometimes I feel you know, like I'm your mother. I am sure that if we asked them, they would go, sometimes I feel like you're my mother, not my wife, right? But it's hard. That's a real one. And I think it's one that we all experience. Thank you for sharing that. Another? Yes. So getting embarrassed because you're impatient and you show it. Tell me how many of you have felt impatient at times. How many of you feel this almost every day? How many of you feel guilty because you feel that way every day? How many of you love? It's creating that balance. I want you just to reach out for one moment right now, and I want you to reach out and don't lean your hand on the table, and some of you were here this morning, but to reach out and act like you're grabbing a ball. And I, this ball right here is grief, the grief that comes with the changes of an illness, the grief that comes with the changes of life. Grip as tight as you can. Tell me what you're feeling. Pain, tense. What else? Huh? Oh, definitely. Break a window, right? Yeah. To be able to throw it away, not the person, but to be able to have it the way it was. Is it moving up your arm? Is it stressful? Could you walk around like this every day? And are we? So let's move your fingers and your arm. Does that feel good? We have to find ways that we can move through it that we can breathe, that we can have the breath moments. You know, I think it's very important. So when you're looking at what's going on in your life, does it help you to know that when you're thinking about everyday life and all the new roles that are taking place and all the different changes that can bring about grief, how it's intrusive thoughts and it's going back and forth, you're trying to be normal, you're trying to be the caregiver, you're trying to do all these different things, is it any wonder why we get exhausted? It helped me. I thought there was something wrong with me because I didn't know why I was so exhausted. And then I would feel guilty that I just need five minutes. And all they wanted to do is I wish I could give her five minutes. I wish that I could have the house clean when she came home. Sometimes they don't tell us that. I had to push them up against the wall, remember? I had to have that... At Italian and Irish type, you know, struggle. Not that we want it like that all the time, but sometimes that's what it comes to. And I did feel guilty when I, when I first said that. But afterwards, it was like I think it needed to be said. Because in that way, I didn't have resentfulness. And it made our life better in sharing it. I did say I didn't want him to die. I thought we were going to have a miracle. But... I, had to, I think I had to name it and claim it. So our minds, again, can be our greatest source of strength or our greatest obstacles. We can think I don't do enough or we can think, you know what? I love and I'm doing everything I can. It's okay to take a moment. It's okay to take a break. Wow, I'm feeling this way. Well, they might be feeling that way. What can I do to share? What can we do to be grateful together? What can we do 
for our own lives to be present to not only their present moment, but to our present moment. And I think because we do take on new responsibilities, that's where the added stress comes, and that's where the exhaustion comes. And that's where the overwhelming anxiety comes, and the fear comes, and the physical and emotional and spiritual challenges come. I couldn't think about if he was, something was going to happen to him. I was just exhausted and felt like there was not enough minutes in a day. And then it was like, I just need five minutes. I just need to sleep a couple of hours. But you know what? I would do anything to have those minutes back. Anything. These symptoms are very much like the symptoms that your loved one is having. So I think the reason I say that today to you about validating what you're going through, they're going through things too. And I don't think they realize what we're going through, and I don't think sometimes we realize what they're going through, but when we look at that whole person, then we stop to think, wow, we're an incredible family that's really taking on a lot, and we can do this together, but it's okay to say, I need time for me. It's okay to recharge your batteries. So it's creating the balance. I use a slinky. And I do grief work, working with bereaved children, teens, adults, and families. Every child gets a slinky. Um, and now all the adults want one too. So I'm trying to find funding for that. Um, but I take a slinky. And if we stop to think of this slinky when I'm first doing it, do you see how I'm going like this? How many of us build a protective wall? Not going to let anybody in. I can do it all. As caregivers, how many people... If somebody says, I would like to help you, you go, oh, I can manage it. How many of you do it on your own? Mm -hmm. But yet we have a hole in our heart. We have a grief. We all have a loss. The loss that we thought things were going to be differently. Not that we would change, not having them. But we've got to find ways that we can move through our everyday life. Sometimes it's taking five minutes at a time. Sometimes it's taking an hour at a time. It's about trying to create a balance. My time was when I felt irritable and stressed out, and I knew I was going to snap. I had to say, you know what? I need to go take a bath right now. And I would go in my room, and I would turn the music on, and I would fill the tub. I'd get in the tub, and I would cry. And then I'd get out of the tub, and I felt refreshed and nude. That brought me a balance. You know, when he was diagnosed, man, I felt like I was bottoming out. How many of you felt like you were bottoming out when you heard that your loved one had an illness? But you notice this keeps springing up. And that's what each of you have been doing, springing up. But we have to find who is it that we can turn to? What is it that helps bring us back up? Do you ask for help? Yes or no? No. Why do you not ask for help? Please? Everybody else is busy. I heard that they're not going to. What's another one? My husband, that's, that is a big one. That your spouse or your loved one would refuse it. I brought in hospice care because, I mean, he was on a feeding tube you know, to have somebody when I was working to be able to get him in and out of bed. Um, I remember the first time that I brought in a nurse. He was furious. He sat in his room. He said, I don't want to see her. I don't want her in here. I hate this, and I'm not doing it. You think that everything, I said, that's not why we have this person in. This person is so that I can go to work and that I can bring home our income, that we can put food on the table and that we can have insurance. But most importantly, it's so that I have a peace of mind that when I'm gone, I don't have to worry about you having a hard time or that you are alone. That allows me to create a balance. 
said, I never thought of it that way. Okay, she can come in my room and I'll talk to her for two minutes. And you know what? He became best friends with her. He needed her as much as I needed her. They became friends. They would pray together. She would do my laundry. She'd make meals for us. She would talk to him about, you know, I'm worried about this and this. I wish I could do this for Sheila. I wish I could do this for my kids. He was getting everything that was inside of him out. He was finding ways that he could move through it. And you know what? It helped me to have the break. And I worked for Procter & Gamble. I was in sales. I was top 10 in the nation. You know, I loved what I did, but I didn't love, love what I did. I wanted to be a mom. I wanted to raise my children. It changed. So after he died, I wanted purpose and meaning in my life. Not that he was not my purpose and meaning, but I wanted to go back to, I want to be a mom. And so I took it to prayer, and I said, what is it that I'm supposed to do? So, and, I, and, and I did this even when he was sick. What am I supposed to do? How do I do it? And I kept getting, take one moment at a time. Take one breath at a time. Take one step at a time. Don't look at tomorrow that he's not going to be this way, that it's going to be different. I remember I didn't go to a Christmas celebration with my family once because I wanted just to be at home with my children and my husband. Big argument because I changed things. And my mother said, you know, your father probably won't be here next year. You know, do you realize what you did to him? And you know what I said? If I looked at that mom, that he's not going to be with me tomorrow or the next day for my husband, I said, then I think I would miss this present moment. And I said, and when I wasn't there with you, mom, I said, I hope you weren't thinking about I don't have this, this, and this. I said, I hope that you were able to be present to that present moment and you enjoyed my brothers and sisters and dad the way you should have done because none of us know what tomorrow holds. Of course, now I'm in that role where my children can't come home at Christmas time. So I understand some, but it's about creating a balance. It's about creating a balance. We don't know what tomorrow holds, but we know we have today. We know that we have a choice about how we live. We have the choice that we can't go and just run and do what we used to do. But we can either become better or we become bitter. So it's important to know it's up to us and our families of how we create a balance. So I want to now talk about honoring with love. Honoring your loved one and yourself. Become a team that cares for each other. What you're giving is a gift of presence. It's a sacred calling in life. Life changes, as we know, when there's a diagnosis with an illness with no cure. We can't take away their pain, but we can share their pain. They can't take away our pain or grief, but they can share that. What we have to do is find ways that we can just be. It's not that you're doing, just to be. That's what we need to do. It's hard for us to slow down in life. I think sometimes when we go through these moments, we realize that it's a soul journey. And it can be S-O-L-E or S-O-U-L. You know, it can be so many different things. It's maintaining compassion with a deep sense of the suffering for one another coupled with the way we wish it had been. We want to relieve, don't we? We want to relieve what they're going through. We also want to relieve what we're going through. There's that compassion fatigue. How many of you think you have compassion fatigue? I think I did. And I can tell you that compassion fatigue to this day, I could do anything and on two to three hours sleep. I still, to this day, have a problem sleeping like six to eight hours. I also have a problem that when I go on overload, because my life, I lived in state of alert mode. How many of you live in state of alert mode? That's what happens when we're care partners. State of alert, and the same way for them. 
state of alert. Ooh, I noticed a change or I can't remember. You know, so is there something? And I think too, when we are going through this as care partners, sometimes our memories change. We can't remember and then we think, what's going on with us? That's because we're tired. That's because we're fatigued. You know, so compassion, satisfaction, the thing that we really need to do is be inspired, you know, with others who are sharing similar circumstances. None of us in this room share the exact same circumstance, but we share a common bond. We love, we give, we care, and sometimes we're tired. I think it's important to realize that there's a lot of different resources for us. I think the one thing that I think I probably needed, but I didn't, is I needed to really do like a self-assessment. Uh, um, and that was to reflect to see what areas in my life were changing. You know, so like when I shared how Vince, the kids would come home and it was like, do this, do this, and this, and this, he probably had compassion fatigue, you know? But how I responded was probably compassion fatigue. You know, are you more sensitive than usual? Um, do you have outbursts? Do you have anger? Um, these are okay to have. It's okay to be angry. It's okay to be irritable. But do we want to be like that all the time? I think it takes more energy to be angry and irritable than it does just to breathe because it works us up, you know? So do you find the small challenges draining? How do you give yourselves that break? Some of you say you don't ask for help, but what do you do to give to you? What are some of the things? Yes. Play cards with your friends. Laugh. I think sometimes we need a comic relief to grief, right? Comic relief to life. What's another thing that people do? Yes. So to take time, give yourself a break. It's okay to go on a vacation. It's okay to spend time with friends. It's okay. And yet in our minds, that greatest source of you know, strength, greatest obstacles, how could I be going on a vacation? It's okay to. You need to nourish. How many of you have seen a wilted plant before? And then you give it water. And within minutes, it's a whole different plant. Well, that's with our souls. That's with our hearts. When we are physically, mentally, and spiritually, all of us exhausted, that's our loved ones and us, we've got to find ways that we can refresh us. One thing for us was watching birds. I never saw a hummingbird until what Vince would do in his time would be look outside and he goes, oh, wait till you see this bird that keeps flying around. And I'm like, I don't even have time to see a bird. Then I saw the little hummingbird. And now when I see the hummingbirds, I can spot them from a distance. And people go, how did you see that? Because I became present to the present moment. That is why. And I think it was because of what he went through. He gave me a gift, a gift of life. <laughs> Tips for creating a balance. I think it's important for you to take time throughout the day to prioritize your task. There was times that I didn't even know. I knew there were so many things I needed to do, but I didn't even know what I had done or what I needed to do. I would create the to-do list, then I couldn't remember where the to-do list was, and then I'd go to bed and i think, oh, I forgot to do this, this, and this. Does anybody else ever do that? One thing nice today is we have cell phones. So we can send ourselves a text, or we can, if we can figure out how to do notes, um, we can put that in there. But I think we need to prioritize our time. Now, sometimes you only have 5, 10, 15 minutes. Probably one of the best things that my mother could tell me was, is I want you to go outside, and I want you to sit, and I want you to breathe, and I want you to soak in the sun. 
Mom, I don't have enough time. I want you to go outside, and I want you to sit, and I want you to breathe, and I want you to soak in the sun. How many of you don't do that? So you need to go out. You need to breathe the sunlight. You know, that produces great vitamin D. I ended up finding out that I had a vitamin D deficiency, and it was because I didn't get out in the sun. And so now, like on a beautiful day like today, just give yourself. If you're working, go outside. Give your, put the timer on. Put the timer on, even if it's five minutes. If you work, is there a place in your workplace that you can just go outside and be? You know why I became top 10 in the nation? Because that was when I did have my break. That was when I could go to work. I didn't have to worry about having to do anything at home. That includes taking care of my children. Rather, I could go and I could interact with people and I could have something that I enjoyed doing. And that really lifted me. And then there would be days that when I'm driving home, I would think, oh my goodness, did his cancer move to his brain? Did it do this? How am I going to do this? And I would pull over and I'd have a good cry. I allowed myself to refresh. Tears are a very good thing. They produce endorphins. And that endorphins is like a natural medicine. Laughter is that way. We needed a comic relief to grief. Sometimes me carrying him to the bathroom, we would start laughing so hard because it was a sight for sore eyes, you know? But we did that. We did that as a couple because this was our journey. This was our lives. Oh, that was intimate. It was intimate. You know, I think we need to have those 15 minutes and you do it every so often. Also, write down the things that are important that you would like to accomplish. What we had wanted to accomplish is one thing, but now what do we want to accomplish? Maybe it's just washing the lampposts, you know, so that, you know, you have just the outside. Maybe it's cleaning your house. I found great satisfaction cleaning my house. I think because I could disconnect, but I had control over that. I had control in being able to do that. I had control over my work. I didn't have control over everything else. So I think that that's how I created the balance in being able to do what I needed to do. It was empowering to me. But yet after my husband died, I didn't go back to PNG. I asked if I could have six months off because I needed it. And they couldn't give me the six months off. They tried to promote me, everything. I was like, no, I need to put me on my to-do list. I just wish I would have put myself on my to-do list before because I think I depleted my adrenal gland. We go, 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 go. So we do have to have those 15 minutes. We do need to put down things that we want to accomplish, and we have to recognize what we have accomplished. You know what I accomplished? Being the CEO of my home, I accomplished that we used every piece of toilet paper. I accomplished that we used the bar of soap. I accomplished that we had leftovers. Now I don't eat leftovers. Um, we eat it all beforehand. But, you know, there's those kind of things that all of a sudden I started realizing, wow, I was accomplishing things that I didn't even realize needed to be accomplished. That I could put my head on the pillow every day. And I could sleep. Even if it was for three or four hours, I had a pillow to lay my head on. I had to look at what I was grateful for. You need time when you go outside or you walk down a hall or anything to refresh your mind. So breathing is a big thing. Everybody right now just take a deep breath and exhale. Breathe in and exhale. How many of you do that? We breathe. You do? Very good. Very good. You know, putting time to do that. We don't realize how little we do that but I think it's important. Exercise. I didn't get time to exercise. I was running all over the place. But I wish that I would have had a program of just doing something. Um, you know, even when we pushed the wheelchair, you know, it was just taking and pushing the wheelchair. But then we also have fun. 
with that wheelchair. We had races. You know, the kids would get in a Barbie van and we'd have dad's wheelchair and we would just see who could win first. Of course, I had to hold on to him. But we had fun that way. You know, and I think that there's so many things that we can have fun with in life. You know, but I don't think we realize that there can be fun. It's a new adventure. So tips for creating a balance. We just did breathing. Listen to music. Meditate. Take a bath. Watch a funny movie. And take time to love. Love what's around you. So we're going to go through some self-care positive affirmations. Because there's hundreds of them. I feel, the, and maybe just close your eyes for just a few moments and I'll share some of these. When you feel lonely and sad, I feel the love of those who are not physically around me. I take pleasure in my own solitude. I love and approve myself. Think of something right now that you can approve yourself of. When I feel terrified without the safety, you know, of being in danger, I focus on breathing and grounding myself. Take time right now to ground yourself. Breathe in and exhale. I draw from the inner strength that lies deep within me and that surrounds me. I trust myself. When you feel insignificant, realize this. I am a unique child of this world. I have as much brightness to offer the world as the next person. I bring light to my loved one. I matter, and what I have to offer this world matters. I may be one in a billion, but I am also one in a million. When you're nervous or afraid, I trust my inner wisdom and in intuition. I breathe in calmness and breathe out nervousness. Breathe in and exhale. When I am angry, I forgive myself for all the mistakes I've made. I let go of my anger so I can see clearly. I accept responsibility if my anger has hurt anyone. I replace my anger with understanding and compassion. I apologize to those affected by my anger. Breathe in. Exhale. When you feel hopeless and at the end of your rope, I may not understand the good in this situation, but it is there. I muster up hope and courage from deep inside of me. Breathe it in and exhale. I choose to find hope and optimisms and for ways to look for this. I refuse to give up because that I haven't tried all the possibilities in all the different ways. When you feel conflicted about a decision, I know my wisdom guides me to the right decision I trust myself to make the best decisions. I listen lovely 
to the inner conflicts and reflect on it until I find peace around me. I show my family how much I love them in all the verbal and nonverbal ways I can. Sometimes I wish that I could do it another way. It's okay to say, I'm sorry. It's okay. There is a good reason I was paired with this perfect family of mine. We are one. I choose to see my family as a gift. I know for me, I am better pers- a better person from the hardships that I've gone through with my family. I know I appreciate life in a way never thought possible before. When you're among friends, I choose friends who approve of me and love me. I surround myself with people who treat me well. I take time to show my friends that I care about them. And even when I don't have the time, I know of ways that I can let them know. I take great pleasure in my friends, even if we disagree in life or live different lives. When you're around strangers, I want you to think I am beautiful and smart, and that's how everyone sees me. I take comfort in the fact that I can always leave, go outside, and take a breath. I never know what's amazing, and I never know what an amazing, incredible person I am, and I don't imagine, can't even imagine who I might meet next. The company of strangers teaches me more about my likes and dislikes. When you're at work, I'm enjoying doing the work. It's fulfilling. I play a big role in my own career success. My career success is me. I engage in work that impacts the world positively. In being a care partner, my role is important. When you don't want to face the day, this day, think, brings me nothing but joy. I want joy. Today will be a gorgeous day, if we allow it. I fill my day with hope and face it with joy. I choose to live this day and participate in this day. When you're worried about the future, think about I will let go of worries that drain my energy. I can't change, but I can embrace. I make smart, calculated plans for my future. I'm in complete charge of planning for my future, which is this moment. When you come face to face with a problem, breathe in and say, I am safe, sound, all is well. There is a great reason this is unfolding before me now. Breathe in. Exhale. Breathe in strength. Exhale. 
Breathe in grace. Exhale. Breathe in love. Exhale. When you want to do more with your life, but you feel stuck, seek a new way of thinking about a situation. And then I want you to believe in your ability to unlock the ways that may set yourself free from the little things in life because you're present to this present moment. When you can't stop comparing yourself to others, compare yourself that you are the highest self. And I'm happy in my own skin, no matter what my circumstances are, because I am me. I see myself as a gift to my people and in my community and my nation. I am me. When you feel you're not good enough, no matter how hard you try, say, I am more than good enough, and I get better every day. I give up the habit to criticize myself. I adopt the mindset to praise myself. Breathe in. I am an incredible person. I care. I believe. I love. I matter. The past has no power over me anymore because I'm embraced. I embrace the rhythm and the flowing of my heart. Hold your hearts now. Put your hands over your hearts. Breathe in. And exhale. I care. Breathe in. I love. I matter. I love. When you're holding your heart so, I think what we have to realize in life is that we hold the key to our hearts. We can think of all the things the way they used to be, or we can think about, I have this moment. What are ways that when you're holding your heart, because this is what we have to do, we hold our loved one's hearts, right? But how can we hold our hearts to provide gentleness for each other, for yourself? How do you hold your heart and take care of you? What are some of those ways? Mm. So the, repeat the question, how do you hold your heart to take care of you? Self-care. Self -care. What are some of the things that you do? So you invest in yourself, in community, as well as for your husband to have community, because when you have that community, you thrive. And you know what you find? Is you find that you're not alone. And that's the power of connection. Yes. How many of you today, when you walked in this room, realize that there's more than just a few of you? power of connection. 
when I knew that there was somebody else who was going through some of the same things that I was going through, it helped me to know that I wasn't alone. What's another way? Quiet time. So the first thing is quiet time, giving it to the Lord. First thing. What a great way. I do the same. Another? So you engage in things that you enjoy, whether it be flower arranging, whether it be singing, knitting, joining a group, playing cards. Those kind of things are very important. Anyone else? Tell me some of your needs. So patience is a gift that you, one of your needs is patience and the patience that it's, we have to slow down. Again, that present to the present moment. Is it hard for us to say what our needs are? So everything slows down, so we need more patience. Yes. Because the person we're caring for is not able to move as quickly mm -hmm. as we might mm -hmm. want. Right. Another one? So one of the things that she just shared, if you did not hear what she said was, is to be able to have a place where she can go for self-care, to have a place where her husband can go and maybe exercise, but a place for her to go and exercise. It might be a place where he can go and find support of others going through his type of illness, but then also you can go to and find support. Again, it's that power of connection because we don't have time to find those places. Sounds like that would be a great thing to volunteer for. <laughs> because you know what, in giving we receive. I remember for me, I wanted to go out to dinner. I wanted to meet people. I wanted somebody to plan that and then finally, I thought, you know what? I have to do this for me. And so we would have, you know, dinners that we could go out and be able to just be and to laugh or lunch or get my nails done. It's finding different things that you can do, you know, in the amount of time that they're gone, that you're gone. But first, you are the person taking everyone there, you know? And so I think that you do. It's a very good validated point. So you were sharing that you belong to a group where you're able to do different things that you love. What I think is very important, it's sharing your resources, sharing the things that you know of where you can find that support, where you can find those moments. I think it's very important. Yes. Uh, I want to mention that we have a care partner group here that meets the first Tuesday of every month at one o'clock. And attendance has been very small. Uh, we only had a few people here this last Tuesday, but during those groups, uh, that is where people are sharing. There's lots of places where people are going where maybe they can exercise together. And also just because your spouse has Parkinson's doesn't mean that the exercise groups always have to be related to Parkinson's. They need to be challenged as much as they can, but there are lots of places. But I encourage you, um, even though the care partner group is held at the same time a loud crowd group is he held, your, your spouse doesn't need to be in that group. Everybody, all of you are invited to come the first Tuesday of the month at one o'clock. And that's where you can share these resources with one another. And they've got some good ideas yes. in there. And if you don't have anybody to stay with your spouse, then they can go to the one o'clock loud crowd group at, that's happening at the same time for that one month, for that one time during the month. It's okay. 
And it might be even during that time that what if you didn't stay here and you all went out to lunch? You know? That, again, when you're sharing resources, though, it's so much more creative. Yes. Size classes all over town, and mm -hmm. I have gone with my wife, but it's way more than I can handle. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't go for an hour. <laughs> right. But that's okay if you go for a short amount of time. It is. Yeah. Yes. So uh, we find other, I find other places to exercise. So finding places to exercise. Exercise is so, so important. Was there someone over here? Because I thought, I yes. But I was going to say the same thing he said. You were, okay. How about questions? Does anybody have any questions? Was this helpful today? Yes. There's a poem that Iris Bolton wrote. Her son had died by suicide. And I use this for everything because I, it really taught me a lot. It's, I don't know why, I'll never know why. I don't like it. I don't have to like it. What I do have to do is make a choice about living. The choice is mine. I can go on living, valuing every moment in a way I thought never possible before. Or I can be destroyed by it and in turn destroy others. I thought that I was immortal and that my children and family were immortal too. But I know now that life is tenuous. So I am choosing to go on living, valuing every moment in a way never thought possible before. You are all valuing moments in a way never thought possible before. You have answered a sacred calling. You are being present to someone's present moment. You are giving sometimes when you don't receive. You are entering a person's life at the most fragile time of their life. You are giving love, sharing love, being love. You're wearing the hats of being a caregiver, care partner. You're being the role of finance, business, education, being the most, the most important medical expert that you can, you give and you share. But you need to receive. Share your journeys with your loved ones. Ask them to share their journeys and you share your journeys. And together become one. Because there is a miracle called friendship. And it dwells within the heart. You don't know where it happens or where it gets its starts. But the happiness it brings you always gives you a special lift when you realize friendship is God's precious gift. And that you have given, the gift of friendship and the gift of love. And I thank you today for allowing me to have the gift of your love and for being an inspiration to me today and helping me to appreciate the journey that Vince and I shared because together we became one. Thank you so much.